Well, good morning, Renewal. It's so good to be with you all this morning. If you're new with us, I'm so glad that you jumped online with us. My name is Derek Puckett. I'm the lead pastor here at Renewal Church of Chicago, and I want you to do a couple things for me. One, I want you to click that link, whatever platform you're on, and the new here link, and I want you to fill out that connect card so we can get to know you a bit and plug you into our church a bit here at Renewal and and hopefully get you in a group or something, but we're so glad that you jumped on with us. And, And I got another thing. If you're new or even if you've been with us for a while, I want you to share this link on all your social media platforms. Go ahead and grab your, you got your phones out probably already. Go ahead and text to somebody the link so they can join us in service this morning. I want them to be here with us and I want them, I don't want them to miss a second of what God is doing at Renewal and the worship here uh, in our church. God has been up to something and through this pandemic, I've been blown away by his faithfulness. Somebody needs to amen that because he's been faithful to you in your life and where you've been today too. Amen. Amen. Well, here at Renewal, our vision is we want to renew, we want to rebuild and release people through the work of Jesus Christ. We want to see Chicago better and the surrounding areas because Renewal Church of Chicago is here. And, and God's using us to do a, amazing things. We want to see the city better. We want to seek the welfare of the city. That's our vision here at Renewal. And I pray that that would be your vision in some kind of way, too. Even if you're not a member here at, Chicago, at, at Renewal Church, we want to see this city better. better. Amen. Well, here, a couple other instructions before we get into our service today. If you got kids in your house, I want you to go ahead and head over to our Renewal Chicago website or click the kids link. There is a host of resources there that our kids director and her team, led by Lauren Harbison, put together every week for our kids to worship and experience Jesus too. And so they're not bothering you. I got five kids. I get it then. And it's hard to sit in the living room with them around and watch service. So we got something set up for them so they can be in their own space. So make sure you go ahead and head over there and get them set up so they can have worship this morning too. A couple announcements before we start. I can't wait to get to worship, but a couple announcements. This coming Sunday, y'all know what it is? Somebody should be shouting it in their house it's resurrection sunday it's the sunday where we all say he got up come on now (laughs) jesus got up from that grave and we celebrate this and if you're new here this is why we celebrate the resurrection is because jesus when he dies on the cross he takes our sins upon himself he dies the death that we deserve he goes to the grave and when he gets up from the grave he 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 conquers sin and death he leaves sin in the grave he also conquers death i don't know anybody that's come back from the dead and i'm pretty sure you don't either but jesus rose from the dead signifying that he has power over it and that's why we celebrate Because that same power is what gives us life today. It's when we believe in him. Now we have life not only now, but life eternally. So uh, we're going to celebrate big next week. So and and we're going to be in a new location. Yes, that's right. We're we're coming back to be in person. We'll still have our live stream, which will happen at 11 a.m. So make sure you know that it's not going to be at 10 a.m. anymore. It's going to be at 11 a.m. So you'll tune in with the 11 a.m. service. But hear me, if you haven't registered right now, I need you to go online and register. I'm pretty sure the 11 a.m. service is already full, but the 9 a.m. service still has some space. So I need y'all to go ahead and register. If they fill up fast enough, we may go ahead and add a 1 p.m., but I'm not doing that until they fill up. But I want you all to jump in with us. I know it's been a tough season. We've been walking through a pandemic. But we're in a space where things are starting to open up and more people are getting vaccinated. I've gotten vaccinated and and we want to venture into this thing together and and try our best to be safe, but also uh, fellowship with one another. I miss y'all. And I hope y'all I know you're missing me, too. I I would hope so. But I I miss y'all and I want to be in person. It's 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 not easy preaching to a camera every week. I want to see my people i want to see your faces and we need each other and and if there's not been anything else highlighted in terms of something we've missed and that it's been that i've I've missed people we've missed each other and so we're going to try to do this as safe as possible temperature tech checks masks will be worn six foot distance and you have to pre-register so don't just show up ramon my bouncer i'm just saying he's the resident of our church he may not let you in but we (laughs) we want you to go ahead and pre-register for that amen go ahead and do that one more announcement if you're 
looking into membership here at our church. Maybe you've been with us for some months or the last year and you're saying, I want to jump in. We're going to have a membership class coming up the week after Easter, the two weeks after Easter. So I want you to go ahead and sign up right now. Uh, that'll be happening after our 11 a.m. service. Jump on in with us. Membership is, we don't take it lightly here. Many of you have joined even in this pandemic. Our church has had new members every time we've done the membership class. And so I know you're listening and you're saying, is this me? Jump on in. You're not committing it to anything yet. You still have to go through that process with us. But we, we hope that and pray that if that's you and you're thinking about it, you'll jump in with us. Amen. Well, let me pray before we get into a time of our a worship this morning. I can't wait for worship. Hope you are the same way as I am right now. Let's pray. Father, God, we thank you for your goodness. You are truly an awesome and amazing God. And as we walk into this holy week, God, would you center our hearts and quiet them. Let us turn down the noise so that we may hear you and we may see you in this week, God. As we think about Palm Sunday when you rode in on that donkey. Savior of the world, God, let us worship this morning, remembering who you are. Let us see you, Jesus. Let us hear from you. Fill our hearts and the places that we're at with you. Let this worship be honoring and glorifying to you. Have your way. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we all say together. Let's worship family. Let's worship.
Good morning, Renewal fam. My name is Pastor Steve, and I have the privilege of opening up the scriptures with you all this morning. If you would, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 11 this morning, and we'll be reading from uh, verse 1 on through a few verses. Uh, While you're turning there, I I do want to remind us that this is an opportunity for us to worship God through our giving in this moment. And uh, God has invested in you and me. He has given us certain gifts and talents and abilities. And part of the act of worship is saying in response that, God, you've been generous to me in my life. Now, in response to that, I want to invest in what you're doing in the world. And you're doing a lot through your local church. And so uh, if you've never given before, I want to encourage you for the very first time. There's different prompts on the screen that you can participate in this for the very first time. And for those of you who are regular givers, allow this moment to be a marked moment where you recognize and acknowledge uh, that you have given something back to God in response to his generosity towards you and me. The New Testament calls for us to be generous givers. The Old Testament talks about a a tithe or a tenth of our income being set aside uh, for the kingdom of God. And so I want to encourage you as you're thinking through what it means to love and follow Jesus, this is a part of uh, what it means to love and follow Jesus, to give in response to God's generosity towards us. So with all of that said, uh, if you are giving right now in this moment, or if you uh, are uh, re- regularly registered to give, and th- this is just sort of a formality uh, in terms of the actual gathering, let's not allow this moment to get past us uh, without marking it. And so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts, God. We recognize that you have invested certain talents, certain abilities, certain gifts uh, in us. Uh, You've given us the opportunity to receive training. You've uh, given us the ingenuity to be ambitious in our vocation, whatever uh, that may look like. And and so, God, in response to what you're doing uh, in and through the world, Uh, as uh, we long to see Jesus' prayer be a reality, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, there there is a a truth to the fact that Renewal Church of Chicago is participating in that. And so we give you these gifts for the sake of seeing that become a reality, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, when you've got Mark chapter 11, do me a favor just for the sake of participation and shout, I got it. I'm reading uh, from the New International Version, and I might refer back to the English Standard uh, if if it makes a more clear point. But here uh, is what Mark chapter 11 says. As they approached Jerusalem and came to uh, Bethpage, And Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell them uh, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They, said, they asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The very words of Scripture. Amen. The movie Coming to America is a comedy classic starring Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall. And if you're like me, uh, this 1988 film was very much woven into the fabric of of your childhood. And 
uh, and people got excited with tiptoe anticipation and bated breath uh, because they, they, they knew that coming to America made the late 1980s, the late 1980s, and, and yet 30 plus years later, they're saying that they're going to come out with a sequel. Uh, and so people were excited, if, if you're like me, and, uh, and, and you just got pumped up as, uh, as we're getting ready to see the sequel to Coming, uh, coming to America. And, and don't worry, I, I'm not going to give it uh, away, but, but if you haven't seen it, you are missing a major part of life. Eddie Murphy plays Prince Akeem, and Arsenio Hall plays his friend and his servant, Simi, uh, and with his regal voice, James Earl Jones plays King Jaffe Jaffer, the king of a flourishing African nation called Zamunda. Uh, and if you watch the movie, anytime the king goes anywhere, right, he is accompanied with a, a, a group of, a, a, of accoutrements and a, a, a group of fanfare that goes along with his travel. Uh, there is thrilling music that begins to play in the background, a motorcade uh, with uh, the flags of Zamunda waving in, uh, in, off the top of the limousines. And finally, when King uh, Jaffe Jaffer would get out of his vehicle and began to walk before he spoke to anybody, uh, there would be uh, flower women who would throw rose petals onto the ground uh, to wherever he walked. And before he speaks to anybody, there would be an ambassador who would announce his arrival. You see, whenever the king of Zamunda went anywhere, it was accompanied with the accoutrements of the most important person in the entire world. As we get ready to come to our passage today, our, our text is what historians call the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And, and much like the king of Zamunda, there is much fanfare at the beginning of his arrival. There, uh, there is much uh, exuberance and, uh, and celebration at his arrival, and yet what you see as the story unfolds is once he gets into Jerusalem, the exuberance and the celebration begins, it begins to fade. Things seem to fall silent when he arrives into Jerusalem. If there were a big idea to our time together in this sermon this morning, it would be this. Jesus' arrival is the most anticipated and most significant arrival in all of human history. Jesus' arrival is the most anticipated and the most significant arrival in all of human history. For our time together, I want to give you a table of contents so you know where we're going this morning. The first thing I want to look at is uh, donkeys tell us more than we know. The second thing I, I want to look at is praise is coming one way or the other. And the third I want to look at is no coming home party. Donkeys tell us more than we know. Praise is coming one way or the other. And no homecoming party. I want to preach from the subject coming to Jerusalem. Coming to Jerusalem. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your kindness towards us. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to hear from heaven this morning through your word in the gospel of Mark, as we anticipate Easter next week, God, would you prepare our hearts to celebrate the truth of the coming King of Jesus Christ, uh, our King who meets the deepest longings of our hearts. He is the most important arrival in the history of the world. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So allow me to set the context from which Jesus begins to enter into Jerusalem. He has completed his Galilean ministry. As a matter of fact, he has just uh, raised a man by the name of Lazarus from the dead. There are people who are accompanying him from Bethany into Jerusalem, and they are celebrating. They have seen him do incredible things, and now uh, people with exuberance uh, and 
uh, an ecstatic celebration, begin to shout on his behalf as he's getting ready to enter into the city. And historically speaking, the Jewish people anticipated that the Messiah or the Christ would enter into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And it's from here, as Jesus is overlooking the city, that he tells his disciples to go uh, to the city and get him something to ride into the city on. He says in Mark chapter 11 and verse 2, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. So oftentimes when people look at Jesus going uh, into Jerusalem on a donkey, they focus on or highlight the humility uh, of Jesus entering into Jerusalem on a donkey. And there is no doubt that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on, on a donkey is a sign of humility, but it's important to know that the symbolism and the image of a donkey is shared with other people in other kings in other parts of Scripture. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 22, there's a guy by the name of Abraham who the Bible tells us is tested by God. His wife wasn't able to have a son for a number of years, but God had promised him this son that was going uh, to be born to him through whom the entire world would be blessed. Uh, And so he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting. And finally, his wife, Sarah, has a child and they name that child Isaac. Uh, And so Isaac is the apple of his father's eye. He is his beloved son, Isaac. This was the child of promise. And now scripture says that God tests him and says, "Uh, Abraham, I want you to take your son to Mount Moriah and I want you to sacrifice him, his his beloved son, his uh, only son. He wants him to sacrifice him. Uh, And so what you get to see, as Scripture tells us, is that the Bible says that Abraham saddled his donkey with his son Isaac. Probably the most important uh, part of his life is his son Isaac. He saddles his donkey, and he goes over to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son. And what we get to see as you read the storyline of the paragraphs and see the story resolve is that God in the midst of this situation where he is testing Abraham and calling him to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac is that God provides a a substitutionary sacrifice. And we might ask ourselves the question, man, what what, what in the world was God doing in that moment? And, And yet when you look at the story of Abraham and Isaac through the lens of the foreshadowing of Scripture and hear the echo of a, another father who has another beloved son who is going to the Mount of Sacrifice. You see, Jesus is the beloved son of God, the son, son upon whom God's favor rests, and he is going to take his son to the Mount of Sacrifice, but this time there will be no substitution. This time he is going to sacrifice his son for your sake and for mine. The echo of Abraham saddling his donkey is pointing forward to Jesus riding in on a donkey. You see, because donkeys tell us more than we know. When King David, who was the most beloved king in all of Israel's history, you could find his storyline of his life in 1 Kings and 2 Samuel, 1 Chronicles, uh, and, and, and he is an elderly man at uh, the end of his life, and his son Adonijah has decided that he wants to throw his own coronation Uh, for him to become the king of Israel. King David has already promised that his son Solomon, and through the promise of God, is supposed to uh, have his lineage go through that of Solomon. He is going to be the one through whom uh, he has an everlasting kingdom, through Solomon and not through his son Adonijah. And so Adonijah decides that he wants to become the king of Israel. His father is elderly and sick, and so he he makes a pact with one of the military leaders and one of the religious leaders, and they decide that they're going to do a private coronation. And so uh, once 
uh, David catches wind that his son Adonijah is trying to usurp his authority and become the king of Israel, he decides he's going to take his son and put him on his royal mule. Uh, he's, he's going to take his son and put him on his royal donkey. Uh, and, and as he puts his son Solomon on his royal donkey and parades him through Jerusalem from uh, the Gihon Spring across to the Kidron Valley, people began to celebrate with uh, adulation and, uh, and, and they begin to praise Solomon and celebrate Solomon. And at the end of him riding through Jerusalem on that donkey, it signified to the watching world and the people of Israel that Adonijah was not the true king. The true king was the one who came riding into Jerusalem on the royal donkey. You see, because donkeys tell us more than we know. The prophet Zechariah would tell of a future king who would be a king of peace. And he says in Zechariah 9 uh, and verse Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nation. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Notice this king is going to be the king prophesied uh, hundreds of years prior who is going to do away with the war horse and the battle bow. He's going to be a king who brings peace. Zechariah 9 and verse 9 says this king is going to be like this. He says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a what? Riding on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. The king of peace comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey because donkeys tell us more than we know. In Genesis 49, Jacob gathers his sons together, and just for the sake of context, Abraham is the one who received the promise from God that he would have a son through whom the entire world would be blessed, and he has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons, and they make up the 12 tribes of Israel, and one particular son is a son by the name of Judah, and Judah is what makes up the lineage of the tribe of Judah. So he says at the end of his life, speaking back over his son's lives and pointing forward in Genesis 49 and verse 10 and 11, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt. There it is to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vestures in the blood of grapes. King David comes from the lineage of Judah. God makes the promise to King David that his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. Jesus' lineage goes back to King David, whose lineage goes back to Judah. And Jacob says, through Judah is coming someone who binds his donkey colt to the choice vine and washed his garments in the blood of grapes. I think you see where I'm going with this. I'm trying to tell somebody that donkeys tell us more than we know. And, and, and here's the picture as, 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 as all of this is in a, a pointing forward to and all of scripture is pointing forward forward to this moment in history, the great anticipation of the king of peace who is going to ride in on a donkey colt. All of scripture pointing to this moment where Jesus walks in to Jerusalem riding a donkey colt. You see, it is the most anticipated and most important arrival in all of human history. But look back with me at Mark chapter 11 and verse 8. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches. They, 
that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So people are, are pumped to see Jesus. They're, they're laying down their branches in front of him. They're, they're laying down their cloaks in front of him. And they're shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They're literally saying, Hosanna, save I pray, save I pray. Verse 10 of chapter 11 Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest, the Messiah or the Christ uh, who the Jewish people had been anticipating uh, of was to come through the line of David, as we've been saying, who was the greatest king Israel had ever had. And now a truer and a better King David, a truer and a better King Solomon was coming in riding on a donkey colt. And Luke's gospel, interestingly enough, as we move into the second portion of our message from uh, donkeys tell us more than we know and to praise is coming one way or the other. Luke's gospel in recording this story of Jesus's triumphal entry uh, records that, that there, there are people there who have seen Jesus do incredible things. Luke 19 in verse 37 says, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Every time before this particular uh, experience, Jesus, every time Jesus performed a miracle, he would tell people, be quiet about that. Keep, keep that. keep that to yourself. And yet in this moment, he says, no, y'all go ahead. Y- y'all go ahead and praise and shout and sing and celebrate. And, and, and Luke's account of the story says there were some religious leaders who tell Jesus to correct his disciples uh, and, and, and to, to kind of set them straight. These religious leaders are, are, are bothered by the fact that Jesus is accepting and receiving worship. Uh, and, 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 and the religious leaders are saying they're, they're worshiping you. you. You know that that's not right. You know that receiving worship is something only God is supposed to receive. But what does Jesus do in response? He says in Luke 19 in verse 40, I tell you to these religious leaders, if these people were silent, the very stones would cry out. If these people did not open up their mouths and shout and sing with exuberance and adulation, the very earth would cry out. Jesus, who has declared, uh, who, who has deflected worship in the past, now fully embraces it. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is why? And the answer is because he has the authority to receive it. Uh, it's, it's because everything that has come before Jesus entered into Jerusalem was leading and pointing toward Jesus uh, entering into arriving to Jerusalem. It's because his arrival is the climax of all of human history. The stones will cry out because Jesus made the stones. The earth will cry out because Jesus made the earth for the scripture says that without him nothing was made that was made, for he is the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. Hebrews chapter 1, if the people don't praise him, something is going to shout for by him and through him and for him are all things. Romans chapter 11, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him he is before all things and in him all things hold together and some of y'all missed your shout you 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 missed your shout be, be, because it's the week before Easter Sunday, but, but you said, Steve, we're in the middle of a pandemic. People are sick. My mental health is bad, so you missed your shout right there. So let me see if I can rewind the tape. The author of creation, the one who spoke the world into existence, left glory, stepped into humanity, lived perfectly, rode his donkey into Jerusalem, signifying himself as the true 
truer and better king of the universe. He came for you. That king, he came for you. He came for me. You see, regardless of whatever we may find ourselves going through in this season of life, the one who everybody had anticipated, the one who holds the universe together, he came for us. He came to reconcile what had been lost between us and God. He identifies with our suffering in the midst of all of what we're experiencing in this pandemic. But not only that, his suffering ensures that he's always with us in our own. Jesus says, if they don't praise me. If they don't shout in adulation, the very earth will grow lungs and cry out in praise of me. If they don't shout and sing, the ground will sing a chorus. If they don't shout and sing, something is going to sing and cry out. Creation will shout, the Messiah is entering into Jerusalem. Because Jesus' arrival is the most anticipated and the most significant arrival in all of human history. So Jesus goes into Jerusalem being ushered in with shouts and praise and in adoration as we've looked at the uh, what donkeys can tell us. And we've we've looked at uh, Jesus uh, and his arrival into Jerusalem and uh, and and we've seen that there uh, that 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 if uh, if 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 they don't shout, then something is going to shout. There's going to be praise one way or the other. And as we move into the third portion of our message uh, and round third and head for home, uh, there's great anticipation, but no homecoming party. No homecoming party. So Jesus goes into Jerusalem being ushered in with shouts of praise and adoration. uh, And in an interesting shift in the progression of the passage, uh, Mark points a... uh, points uh, a very anticlimactic shift in verse 11. Uh, It says, And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So he arrives in the city, and there's no more celebration. No more shouts of praise and adoration the way Mark articulates it. Jesus, who is the centerpiece of the people of God's faith, goes into the centerpiece of the people of God's worship in the temple and nothing really happens. There's uh, there's no feast for the king's return. There's no trumpets, no music, no celebration, uh, no uh, no uh, no uh, flower people that throw roses on the ground like King Jaffe Jaffa, the, the the king who they had been waiting for for so long. This king who was anticipated, the king who the prophets had spoken of, this king who was the one who Abraham and Isaac's story echoed forward to, this king who was going to restore and renew all things. They did a lot to get ready for the party, and there was no party. No celebration for the one who receives worship. As a matter of fact, the rest of Jesus' life after the triumphant entry, triumphal entry is going to be characterized by rejection and hate. It's, it's as though the people of God had spent all this time getting ready for the party and never actually went to the party. Y'all remember when we used to go to parties? Pre-pandemic. I was thinking back this earlier this week of my friend Ricky's 40th birthday party, and there was a bunch uh, of uh, stuff that went into it, and uh, and the venue was dope. The the uh, they, they were in a uh, kind of a, a flower shop, um, and, and and they had all the flowers spread out. 
uh, and it was like a garden slash flower shop, and they had uh, they had food and they had drinks and they had uh, they had a, a really incredible DJ. Shout out to DJ Ron, aka DJ One Sec, and uh, and and so they had all of this stuff together, and it was off the chain. And a great amount of anticipation went in. People flew in uh, for this party. And, and it made me think, it reminded me of all the stuff that you uh, got together to get ready for something like the prom or one of your first dances. Y'all remember the prom? I, I remember when I was getting ready for the prom, we had to make sure that the ride that we was getting into was nice. And so we rented a limousine and and I was one of those people that didn't want to look like everybody else. And so, uh, you know, everybody's wearing purple or everybody's wearing powder blue. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to wear periwinkle. And y'all don't even know what that is. That was the entire point. And so uh, I didn't want to be in a regular tuxedo. So I went and got the zoot suit tuxedo. And, you know, they, they always try to give you those like round toe patent leather shoes. And I was like, nah, I'm not, I'm not feeling that. I'm, I'm going to do something different. And so I got some all-white uh, crocodile print uh, shoes with, with wooden soles. And so I was just fresh. And I even stepped into the barbershop, and I, I told my barber, I said, man, this, this can't just be any old thing. This is special. Today I need you to do something special. I, I can't just get a regular light fade. This is back when I had the finger waves and all of that. And, and, uh, and so I, I said, man, give me the taper fade. And so he gave me the coldest haircut that I had ever gotten. And, and, and you know, ladies, you, you know, you went out and you got your nails done and you got your hair uh, on, on point and you got all your stuff together. You, uh, you got your mints together because you never knew when you was going to get you a kiss and you wanted to be prepared on prom for your kiss. And so you prepared for everything that, 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 uh, that it would be an incredible time, right? And so you got all your stuff together and you're uh, in great anticipation of, of all of what this is about to be and look like. Now imagine you've done all of those different things over the course of the past several weeks and you roll up in the limousine and you walk into prom and nobody's there. There's no party. There's no celebration. There's no praise. There's no cake. There's no music. It's just empty. The whole history of the people of Israel's worldview was pointing to this moment. And they didn't throw the party. And, and while you and I may look our noses down like, why, why didn't they celebrate that? Why, how, how in the world did they miss Jesus in that moment? Like, like what in the world uh, w- were they doing? They, 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 they forgot to celebrate. Why? Why? Uh, why didn't you guys throw a party for your king? And, and, and here's the reality. The beauty of the gospel is that the deepest longings of our hearts has arrived in Jesus. And the sad thing about the gospel of Jesus is that you and I often forget to throw our own party. All the while we say, Jesus, all right, I got Jesus, man, cool. That, that, I, you know, we, we sort of look our noses down at the people of Israel, and then in our own lives, we like, all right, I got Jesus, Jesus is cool. Now, Jesus, come with me to this other celebration. Jesus, we're trying to get this promotion. Jesus, we're trying, we trying to get this new job. Jesus, we're trying to move to this new city. Jesus, we, we, I, I, I want to find me a man. Jesus, I want to find, find my wife. Jesus. Jesus, come over to this new, come over to this new party. To the new house, to the new thing. And all of those are good things. And yet, if you're crushed by not receiving those things, you missed it. You missed the celebration. We want Jesus to take us to all types of other celebrations where we say, like, hey, 
Let, let's go do this and let's go do that. God, would you bless this and would you bless that? Saying all of the deepest desires of our hearts are these other things and this other thing and that other experience. And we get disappointed when he doesn't give us those things. And the whole time Jesus is standing here saying, I am the celebration. It's not when you get over there. It's not when you do that. It's right here, right now. You see... not when you get your breakthrough. It's not when you make partner. It's not when you make that certain amount of money. The celebration is now. And Jesus is saying, The deepest longings of your soul have been met in me because I arrived. So before you move on to the next thing, let's throw the party. And the beauty of the gospel storyline is that the party never has to end. Because the reality is the deepest longing of our soul has been met in him. So every day gets to be a new celebration. Mercies are new every morning. You see, it's because Jesus died in our place and for our sins that we have access to the God of the universe. We no longer have to live from celebration to celebration, but we can remain in the celebration of the gospel for all of our days. It's, it's because Jesus rose in victory over Satan's sin and death that I don't have to leave my celebration on Sunday morning, but I get to celebrate the good news of Jesus every single day of my life. It's because Jesus defeated Satan's sin and death that my faith doesn't have to be uh, kind of this reflective contemplation and personal thing, but it can be a lasting, continual, continuous celebration. You see, the same king who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, and who rode into Jerusalem on a lowly donkey colt is the same king who Revelation calls the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who was slain for you and me. So let's celebrate today. Let's celebrate next week. Let's celebrate tomorrow and for the rest of our lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for Jesus. We know that all of Scripture is pointing to him. The temple, the tabernacle, the sacrificial system, the promise to Abraham, the promise to David, the promise to the people of Israel. And now, God, we get on the other side of that promise. And please, God, don't allow us to miss the party. Please allow us the freedom to celebrate, to abide in Christ, to experience the love of the Father. Because the God of the universe sent His only Son to be a substitutionary atonement for us so that we could experience You and to experience the one who created all things. You are the good father who gives good gifts to his children, who steps into the suffering to be with us in the midst of what we experience in this world. You're the one who will never leave us nor forsake us. You are the burden bearer, the head lifter, the doctor who's never lost a patient, the lawyer who's never lost a case. You are the one who sticks closer than a brother. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen.
We're going to continue and worship God through communion this morning. And communion is something that Jesus Christ set aside for his followers, for those people who had committed their lives to following him. And so on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. uh, And he said, this is my body given for you. Uh, Take and eat. Same night, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. As we participate in in communion, we remember that Jesus didn't just arrive. Uh, He didn't just come uh, and enter into Jerusalem on a donkey as the truer and better king. But ultimately, he was willing to be that substitutionary sacrifice for us. Uh, He was the one who went uh, to God's mountain on Calvary, uh, and he was the one who became the substitution for your sin and for mine. Uh, And it's through him and faith in him, as the grace of God provided for you and me, that we receive connection to the God of the universe. And through that faith, we get united to Jesus, and the God of the universe becomes our Father and calls you and me on the basis of our faith in the grace that he provided, beloved. That's my word to you this morning. If you're in Christ, you are the beloved of God. So go in peace. You're loved. See you next week at Easter. Sign up online to reserve your spot. With that said, look up here and receive this as your benediction. Now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you now and forevermore. Go in peace. You are loved. God bless.